But I do want to share what I feel the Lord has laid upon my heart. Brother Timmy, I'm going to switch to the cordless, if that's okay. White one, please. Perfect. Praise God. And we want to begin reading uh, in the scriptures in the Gospel of Mark. And actually, if you could put the first two verses up on the, the uh, overhead there, uh, brother. Mark, the second chapter, I want to reach back and read one, verse 1 and 2 as well. And I think I had those in my list there. Praise God. I want to begin to read through to verse 5 and then skipping from verse 11 through to 12. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway there were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of palsy lay. Verse 5, and when Jesus saw their faith, I'd like you to take note that he didn't say his faith. He said, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of palsy, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Rolling a forward a little bit there to verse 11 and 12. And I say unto thee, arise, take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, he took up the bed and went forth before them all, insomuch they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. Flipping also to the Gospel of Luke. For two verses there, uh, Luke, the fifth chapter, and verses 8, 18, and 19. Praise God. And behold, the men brought in a man which was taken with palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before them. And when they could not find a way, by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, uh, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And also we want to turn to Isaiah 1 verse in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 52 and verse 7, Isaiah 52 and verse 7. And when you get it, say Amen. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that say, un, saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. With the help of the Lord uh, this evening, I'd like to speak for just a few moments on the subject, Raising the Roof of Unbelief. Let's reach out to the Lord and let's ask God to bless his word to our hearts and souls tonight. Lord Jesus, we love you today, God, and we're so thankful, God, to be in your house, God, and to sing the songs of Zion, to worship you, God, to magnify you. Lord, we need your help, God, I pray, Lord Jesus, and Lord, we depend upon you, God, even like a child unto his father and mother. Lord, we rest upon your promises and rest upon your word and rest upon you, God, I pray, Father, my God, and Lord, that you would strengthen, God, your people tonight, and Lord, give us ears to hear what the Spirit would say in these last days and Lord Jesus we need you God and we need your touch Lord we need your strength and we need the Holy Ghost God I pray to quicken us and, and to touch us God and help us God and Lord Jesus I pray in this day and generation and Lord I pray God and we ask all these things and in Jesus mighty name and the name of Jesus praise God Amen. Praise God. And you may be seated tonight. We begin to notice when we are reading 
And I'd like to share this simple thought with you tonight. But in these scriptures that we have read tonight, we get a picture of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in action. This is actually uh, what these people were doing, uh, that the only way that they could get someone through to Jesus is they had to all do it as a team. Teamwork makes the dream work. And if people are going to get through to Jesus, that they're going to have to be helped. And uh, God leaves his church upon this earth uh, with that mission in mind to help continue his mission. And that is to seek and to save uh, that which was lost. Uh, If his mission is to continue and to bear fruit the way he intends, then I believe the apostolic church... uh, of our generation uh, uh, must focus upon the completion of Christ's mission. We must continue the work that he started. Uh, And in fact, that Jesus uh, commissioned his disciples uh, in uh, Mark, the 16th chapter, and verse 15. uh, He said, Go ye forth into all the world uh, and to preach the gospel to every creature. That is the continuation of the ministry and the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, which he began upon the earth, uh, and uh, that he would uh, continue to work and that he would continue to move. Now, when we begin to look at these verses, there's not a lot of indication. If you were to read through them and to study them, uh, we don't find a whole lot of uh, indication that there was much faith on the part of the sick person. Uh, because we find that maybe he was too sick to notice. Maybe he was too sick to care. Maybe he didn't really understand. All he knew, he didn't feel very good. He was very, very sick. Um, uh, But we did notice in this reading of these verses how that Jesus noticed the men that carried him. He noticed their faith. He looked up and he noticed the faith that they had. And uh, when, because it says in Mark 2 and verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us that maybe it was a family member of one of the the individuals that was carrying him. Uh, Maybe it was a friend. The scripture doesn't elaborate on that part. But we do know that the main force of faith that was being used in this instance was the faith that was in those four men that carried that sick man. They had faith that if they could only get this man into the presence of God, and if they could only get him into the presence of God and get to the front uh, of all this big crowd and multitude that was gathered there, then they knew that he could be healed, that he would be all right. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11, chapter, verse 6, um, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you want to impress God, if you want to get God's attention, if you want God to sit up and take notice, uh, then the first thing that you have to do is to put your confidence uh, and your faith and your trust in him. Uh, Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We sing that song sometimes, put your trust in Jesus, um, and he will see you through. It was for you he bled and died. Um, Praise God. But if you're going to see anything happen, you're going to have to put confidence in him because faith is the currency of heaven. Praise God. And everybody that is in heaven speaks the same language. And I'm not talking about French. English, Spanish, (laughs) Hebrew, Greek, whatever you want to call it, whatever kind of language you want to refer to. I'm talking about the language of faith. But we notice in reading these verses how that their properly focused faith brought unity. They determined that all four had to work together and that if this man was ever going to get to see Jesus, they had to work together. In this instance in Scripture, we have a type or illustration of the body of Christ um, in action and the role that the church plays in bringing a soul to Jesus Christ. Now, there are four things I want to focus on in this message tonight. Four primary things we can notice about these four men that carried this sick man 
that had palsy to Jesus. The first thing we need to notice is these four men had faith. They had confidence. They knew if they could get this uh, man through to Jesus that he would be healed. See, the main obstacle to their faith uh, was one, the crowd. It was worse than Walmart in Christmas rush time. <laughs> <laughs> because oh, everybody was there. They were all pressed to the door. You ever see those Black Fridays, those little video clips, you know, people trying to get in the door and everybody's running over everybody else trying to get to this Cabbage Patch doll or whatever it is. <laughs> you know, <laughs> one grabs it out of the hands of the other one, then the fist fight erupts, you know. Uh, it was worse than one of those because everybody was pressed into that building. <laughs> they were all crammed in there. And you, can you imagine, you see these guys carrying this guy on a couch. And so they bring him up and try to get in. And excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And no one's moving. You can't get them in. They, that's, that's an obstacle. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty big obstacle. You know? <laughs> there are so many people gathered together that they couldn't even get near the door. They couldn't get anywhere close to the door at all. And so they chose the roof. So then the roof became their second obstacle. So here they are up on the roof. The building's all surrounded by people. And the roof most likely was made of the clay tiles with a, under supporting a frame of wood. And because we can understand this from Luke's account in uh, chapter 5 and verse 19, when he says, and they let him down through the tiling. That word that's used, tiling, there is a Greek word called kiramos. It means clay tiles. And uh, with his couch into the midst of the people. So we notice that the roof itself represented uh, uh, unbelief and obstruction and something that had to be removed so they could get to Jesus. So they could get this man into where they needed to have him so that Jesus could minister unto him. And I don't know about you, but it takes a lot of work to make a big hole in a roof. How many's ever done carpenter work? How many's ever tore down, tore down old buildings? That's the fun part, sledgehammers and sawzalls and, you know, all these axes, you know, and chop, bang, crash, you know, <laughs> beat and thrash construction, you know. And uh, so you're, you're building, tearing stuff down. Essentially what these guys did was they become a four-man wrecking crew. And so here they are trying to make on the roof, trying to make a hole big enough to let a guy on a couch down. Now, I've taken the couches in through elevators. I've taken couches when we lived in an apartment out in Ontario. <laughs> we had a, a sectional that we had to take to, what floor was it, six, fifth? Eighth floor. We had to take up to the eighth floor. We had to take a sectional. And uh, when we tried to get it in the elevator, uh, it was interesting. Uh, we had to take it apart, and then we had to, somebody had to get underneath and try to push it up while the other person was pushing down until we could stand it on its edge. But it wouldn't quite fit completely in that way. Because we had to stand on its edge until it, it was up and touching the ceiling inside the elevator. And the bottom was on the floor. We couldn't take it up the stairs. <laughs> that would have been too big of a job. But here we're trying to get this sectional in. It's a couch. Then, of course, we try to get the couch in the house we have. And it, when we had the sectional, and we turned it on our side, and we put it in there, and then we cram it through the door, and, and we tear off the door jam, or not the door jam, the uh, weather stripping on the way in, trying to get it in through the door. So it's not an easy job to try to get a big couch into a house. But can you imagine, and I'm sure that this couch this guy was laying on was not as big as a sectional would be by any means, and, uh, can you, but can you imagine, here they are on the roof, can you imagine what the people down below were thinking? Wow, squirrels are big up there today. You're having a time. And then first thing you know, you see pieces of the ceiling are falling. 
And here's Jesus ministering to the people, and he's at the front. Of, he's up at the front, and everybody's surrounding him. And all there's pieces of ceiling falling down on top of their on top of their heads. And then the hole gets bigger, <laughs> and bigger, and bigger, until finally they get it big enough. Like this is a lot of work we're talking about, folks. <laughs> Finally, it's big enough until they got a bit hole big enough to let the man down in on his bed. But because they had faith, because they had confidence in God, they were ready to raise that roof. They're ready to destroy it. And I'm talking about the word raise, R-A-Z-E, to destroy or scrape off, the old French word, razor, to demolish. Because they had faith, they knew if they could only get them into the presence of God and if they could only get them close enough uh, to the master so Jesus could look and touch him, uh, they knew that this man could receive a miracle and have his life changed forevermore. Praise God. Hallelujah. And Jesus became moved by their faith. He saw their faith. They knew that Jesus had what this man needed. And he was, if he was going to survive or be healed, otherwise he may die. He just wanted to get him in the presence of God. Do you know that there are souls in this world that need Jesus? Many souls need Jesus. And we meet them every day and we talk to them and we look into their eyes and we have conversations and we work with them. Uh, and there are people that need to have a touch from God. Uh, there are people that have troubles and trials and sorrows in their life, uh, and Jesus wants to touch uh, each and every one of them. He wants to reach into their life uh, and change them uh, with his power and give them a reason to live. Uh, praise God. Hallelujah. And the, word, the church of the living God must work together and carry souls to Jesus. Um, see, the disease that infects humanity is sin. The Bible says in uh, Romans 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is the sickness that humanity has. But the only cure for that is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Um, I see a crimson stream of blood uh, and it flows from Calvary. Its waves would reach the throne of God, and they sweep over me. Praise God. Hallelujah. We could only get them into Jesus, into the presence of Jesus. Then Jesus can minister, and he can touch. The second thing we noticed, they were very, very, very persistent and determined. Tearing up the roof. Jackhammers, claw hammers, pickaxe, axes, sawzalls. No, they didn't have all, any of that stuff, but <laughs> no doubt they probably had a wrecking bar, maybe. I don't know if they find a wrecking bar on that guy's roof or not. But they were persistent. They were determined. They were going to get in there. They had a determination. And uh, this was the motiva motivating force for their actions. They saw the crowd, the things that could be a hindrance to getting this man to Jesus, but they decided amongst themselves um, they were going to be persistent. Uh, they were going to keep on working. Uh, they were going to keep on pushing. Uh, they were going to keep on pressing their way in uh, until they got this man at the feet of Jesus. Uh, there is some times when you're living for God uh, that you need to become determined, uh, that you need to get a determination in your heart, uh, that you you're going to make heaven your home and become determined. Hallelujah. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. The violent take it by force. What's it talking about? It's talking about determination. <laughs> that you're going, to make, you're going to get to heaven. Praise God. That you're going to do what God wants you to do. Praise God. Hallelujah. But when they uncovered the roof, this was proof of their persistence. See, the roof was an obstacle to getting this man through to Jesus represented unbelief, you know, but they were going to remove that. Praise God. 
In Acts 2 and verse 39, the scripture says, For the promise is unto you, to your children, to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord God are sh- shall call. In Revelations 22 and se- uh, 17 says, Whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. See, they could have given up at any point in time, uh, but they knew if he could get him to the water of life, uh, that his life could be changed. Uh, Hallelujah, praise God. And he could become born again of the water and of the Spirit. So many times, and I know we're all guilty of this. I'm guilty of it. If anybody honest-hearted would say they are as well. That you look at somebody and think that they would never be interested in church. They would never really want to come. They're too rough. They're too, you know, they got too many issues in their life, and it just seems like that that God is the last thing on their mind. And I remember one time out west when we were passing out tracts, and I may have mentioned this one other time, but we were passing out tracts, inviting people to the camp meetings, uh, and I walked up to two biker dudes. And I know Pastor Trail has a motorcycle, and he wears black leather when he's biking. And I'm not talking about Brother Trail. (laughs) But I walked up to two biker dudes, and they looked every bit the biker dude. Because they looked like they were in a motorcycle gang. They may have been wearing colors, I think, as well, for being part of a a club. And uh, passing out tracks to them. Inviting them out to meetings where the Holy Ghost was being poured out uh, and people were uh, repenting, getting baptized, and receiving the Holy Ghost. Uh, so I talked to these two guys with their Harleys uh, and on the street and invited them out to church. Uh, praise God. Now, one thing we think, you know, automatically think they're going to, they're you know, <laughs> chase you out of there with a stick, you know. They're going to be angry. They're going to give you a response like this. But you know, they were the nicest, most polite people ever. And they thanked me, and they were really honestly, you know, they, they were very, very polite and listened intently to everything we had to say and talked to them as we give them the tracks, and they took the tracks. You never know who that person is that you're witnessing to that they may be the next Apostle Paul. They could be the next missionary. They could be the next one to go preaching the Word of God and see multitude revivals. Uh, Praise God and people come to God and be born again. Uh, You never know exactly that person that you're talking to, that they may be the next one. Praise God. So sometimes you've got to persist. Hmm. I remember reading of, in a book one time, and I believe it was a missionary book, about Bill Dross, the Pentecost. And, of course, they were over in, in England, and, they, of course, they had to go before they went in the war. They had to travel to where it was. And they were out past no tracks. They had gospel services. And they were past no tracks, and this colonel was walking by. And they were past no track to him. He said, don't give me this rubbish. I don't want this rubbish. Don't give me this rubbish. And he just tried to rebuff them and rebuff them and rebuff them. You know, don't give me this. And they persisted a little bit. And they started talking to him about Jesus and persisting a little bit. In in spite of his gruff exterior, they kept on persisting. And first thing you know, the tears came in the man's eyes. uh, Because, see, he used to have an experience with God. uh, And they began to talk to him. Uh, He broke down right in the street and repented. uh, And he he, he said he was going to start coming to church again. Praise God. Because they persisted. There's sometimes you've got to put a little persistence there. In James, the second chapter, verse 26, uh, uh, the Scripture says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so is faith without works is dead also. Sometimes you need to put a little bit of feet to your faith. Praise God. The third thing that, about these men were that they were in one accord. Can you imagine the sick man? If they're trying to lower him down, if one all of a sudden let go of the rope. Or the other guy said, no, I'm, you're going too fast. Slow down, slow down. So he started pulling up on the rope, and the other guys are lowering down on the rope. They had to lower the guy down <laughs> fairly level in order for him to get down to where he would be in front of Jesus. 
So that required unity. Praise God. Hallelujah. There's something about unity in a church that working together that attracts the presence and power of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. And I'd like to make a statement right here that you can't have apostolic revival without prayer and unity. The Bible says all through the book of Acts, they were in one accord, in one place. Hallelujah. Praise God. They worked together and they had revival. They that have turned the world upside down have come here too. <laughs> Praise God. We need to have unity because, see, it's a group effort. Teamwork makes the dream work. One of those things I stuck on my wall one time or I printed off a poster or I got it on my desktop. Teamwork makes the dream work. Because, see, we need each other. We need to, to strengthen one another. We need to help one another. We need to work together one with another. Praise God. Because it's a group effort. Uh, and if people are going to get to Jesus, uh, we're going to have to work together like the, bur the book of Acts early church did. Uh, and we need to preach the Word of God. We need to live the Word of God. Uh, we need to work together and to bring people to church, uh, witness to them, uh, proclaim to them that Jesus is hope for them. Uh, Praise God, hallelujah, so that Jesus can change their life. One of the best scriptures, of course, that we use and we read many times, Acts, the second chapter, verses 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Hallelujah. They were all praying. They were all seeking God. They're all focused on Jesus. And, and they were all there together. And the Bible says... Um, that there appeared unto them uh, cloven tongues like as a fire. It came in a mighty rushing wind and came and filled that house where they were sitting. Praise God. They were praying. Prayer. Unity. That's what Brother Allen mentioned tonight about prayer. Praise God. I'll tell you something. We need it. We need prayer. And I don't pray enough. I need more prayer in my life. But the book of Acts is our pattern, our blueprint for end-time revival. In 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 6, the scripture says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Um, uh, Paul said he planted and Apollos watered, uh, but it was God that poured out of his spirit, that touched, that ministered, uh, that gave the increase. Um, in Psalms 133 and verses 1 and 2, it says, Behold, how good uh, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious ointment upon the head. The ointment that he's referring to is the anointing oil. And it's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down on the beard and even Aaron's beard and went down to the skirts of their, of their garment. Uh, there is something about prayer and worshiping and being one accord uh, that sets an atmosphere to carry hungry hearts into the presence uh, of Almighty God. Um, and every time you begin to worship uh, the Lord and raise up your hands and, and magnify Him, it's just like a magnet that draws the presence of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Because in His presence is fullness of joy. Hallelujah. Praise God. See, it takes focus and commitment and strength and much prayer to carry souls to Jesus. Canada needs men and women of commitment. Canada needs people of compassion, anointing, and burden, and truth to carry Canadians to Jesus. Praise God. Our, our country is in deep trouble, folks. Our country is in turmoil and deep trouble, and there's problems everywhere. But if we can get them to a point where they can focus on Jesus and we can have revival and begin to let the fires burn so that souls realize uh, that there is a place of hope, uh, that there is a th something that they can look to, and we, they can meet with Jesus, and He can change their life. Praise God. He changed my life, and he made me happy. See, our world is in turmoil and confusion and fear. Darkness covers our country. The apostolic church needs to arise and awake. 
Hallelujah, praise God, to get people to Jesus before it's too late. And uh, what the world needs is Jesus. Jesus is the answer. One of my favorite songs. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there's no other. Jesus is the way. Hallelujah, praise God. As we stand together tonight, we find that the scriptures with the disciples the Gentiles started hearing about Jesus. And uh, they had heard about the miracles. They heard about the healings. They heard about the deliverance, devils being cast out. They heard about the teachings, the parables, and the truths that Jesus proclaimed. And so these Greeks came to the disciples one day. In John 12 and verse 21, it said, Sir we would see Jesus. <laughs> Praise God. See, the answer is found in the words spoken by Jesus. In John, the 12th chapter, verse 32, he said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. God wants to use you, and he wants to use me to witness and pray and use our faith to lift someone and carry them to the feet of Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. And this is the cry of our generation, even though they may not know it yet. Even though people don't realize it. Sir, we would see Jesus. The whole world waits for the church to arise in the name of Jesus. In Romans 8 and verse 9, for the ex earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. <laughs> because people are looking at you. People may not read a Bible, but they will read you. And they'll watch you and see how what you do. Praise God. And you may be the only Bible that somebody ever reads. Praise God. But I want my life to be as the master's so when they look at me, they look and they see Jesus. They see an example of someone that is hungry for God. I don't know about you, but there is a hunger in my heart. Uh, I want the presence of God. I want the touch of the Lord. Uh, I want God to breathe upon us. I want the Holy Ghost to move. Uh, I want there to be revival from the pulpit to the pew. I want there to be a move of the Holy Ghost. Uh, but we need to work together. We need to be in one accord. Uh, hallelujah. Praise God and work together to carry souls to Jesus. Um, hallelujah. Lord, send revival. Let it start in me. Praise God. These altars are open if you'd like.